Hi everybody, it's Phil here from Talbot Koi Pond on a fairly glorious Sunday afternoon. Um, not really got anything specific to talk about today because uh, if you see my last video you'd have realised that the last of my big sort of pre-season jobs, putting the cover on the uh, pergola, is all done. So this weekend really has just been sort of uh, messing about, lazing, checking, doing all the normal maintenance bits that you would expect to do. Um, but I'm sort of very conscious that I keep being asked questions which is absolutely fantastic when I put a video out people asking what's this what's that what's the other and obviously I keep answering them um, but I thought it would be a good idea to sort of touch on the main points again um, just just to put it out there basically I'll give you an overview of my pond and then just uh, I'll answer some specific questions that have come in some of them fairly recently so if I can start with just uh, sort of giving you an, an overview of the pond I'm gonna get soaked by the fish in a minute because they're coming up for food um, so you will have all seen the pond this is it this is my uh, my dream pond for a moment or two um when we first set out to build this if you have a look at the plans in the very very early videos it should have been uh, 12 foot by six foot by five foot deep it actually ended up being uh, 15 foot by five and a half foot deep by five and a half foot wide and that was primarily due to a lot of problems we had with the walls collapsing and the, the soil itself underneath um there's actually 16 inches of concrete on the bottom of this pond because we had to do the bottom pour twice so if it hadn't if we hadn't done that twice it had been there you know it would have been six foot deep but five and a half foot i'm happy with that it holds um almost spot on two and a half thousand gallons uh, which is around about eleven thousand four hundred liters um i've just got one spin drifter uh, bottom drain and that's of that's running on four inch pipe work back into the filter house my um, filter is an ORZ Proficlear premium compact L gravi gravity drum filter that's why I'm having to read it I can't remember all this stuff um, and there's an I've also bought the ORZ individual unit which which sort of goes on to the end of it so the drums in one section the bio filters in in what in another section of the actual drum filter unit and then it goes into basically a big black box but it's purposely designed to help hold some more media and the ORZ pumps and um, the UV system that I've got in there as well so the pumps I'm running I'm running uh, and two pumps an ORZ Acromax 12,000 C and an 18,000 C and the C just signifies basically that they're controllable so they're just like dairy pumps basically you know you can turn the power up and down and have them running at different uh, different things um, they're both running at 40 percent typically so running at 40 percent that is around about two and a half two thousand six hundred gallons um, so basically the entire contents of my pond in theory are being turned out over um, once every hour um, I will be making some adjustments to that and actually slowing it down this summer but I'll talk about that in a different video. The majority of pipe work other than the bottom drain is one and a half inch, it's all pressure pipe. Um, my gravity, uh, sorry my gravity, my UV filter is an ORZ Bitron 55 watt gravity UV um, and then heating it all um, I've got a Thermatec 12 kilowatt inverter heat pump. So that's that's fundamentally my uh, my pond. Um, so what, I, what I'm going to do is sort of just I'll take you into the filter house. So we'll have a look at the pump, and I'm just going to do a couple of short segments now, just to ask, and answer a few questions on uh, on those particular items. So I'll snap back to you in a bit. So um, my heat pump, Thermatec inverter, swimming pool heat pump. Um, that I get a lot of questions on and they're quite regular questions so I thought I'd answer a few of these as well. The first uh, question I get asked quite often is what flow rate do I run through the um, air source heat pump? Um, and I, think, I think the best answer to that to be honest obviously this is the uh, this is the booklet that comes with it, the instructions. My answer to that is always going to be um, go with whatever the um, manufacturer recommends so I've got the 12 kilowatt um, heat pump um, and if we follow this down the nominal flow rate is uh, there we go nominal flow rate so it's 4.7 meters cubed per hour and obviously 4.7 meters cubed per hour is 4700 liters and what I'm running it on I've got a uh, 1200 litres per hour air pump, I think so, what this calculation is at the top. I've got a 1200 litre per hour air pump 
and it's working at 40% so roughly that's 4,800 litres per hour um, but obviously once you've allowed for a little bit of pipe work and on this there are only three um, shallow bends um, that's that's going to be round about the 4,700 litres per hour and to be quite honest if it's not running fast enough if there's not enough water going through it then um, you'll get the error message come up on the on the heat pump itself so we'll just nip outside and I'll, uh, I'll show you that and answer a few more questions about the settings so I'm not quite sure how uh, how well you you're going to actually see this, but obviously we've got the the control panel cover there. The control panel uh, is colour and it's all touch sensitive. And as you can see where we stand at the moment, the air pump's on. It's got the security lock on. Um, the water's at 17.5 degrees and it's on summer heating mode. Um, there you go. It goes off after a while. So yeah, so the, the first thing I suppose is um, I always keep mine locked just because I can. I think the idea of a lock is if you've got one of these on a swimming pool as a rented accommodation, obviously you can lock it to stop uh, whoever's renting the premises off you from changing the temperatures up and down. But obviously you just, uh, you know, whatever the uh, whatever the lock is on there that you want to put, um, I can't even remember what it came with to be honest with you, but you just change it to whatever you want. Let me just put that in. And obviously that opens it up then and then once you've uh, once you've taken the lock off obviously you can change all these so if we just click on my temperature it's set at 17 degrees and as i've just said it's at 17.5 at the minute and it's on summer mode so you can have it on summer mode you can have it on uh, cooling mode or you can have it on automatic so it just does both depending on what you've got the, the, set, the temperature set on if we go into the settings then obviously you put your uh, put your code in again. Oops, bear with me. And you've got a whole raft of uh, you've got a whole raft of settings and things you can do here. But having said that, you haven't got anywhere near as many um, codes as uh, as you've got if you're an actual Thermatech engineer and those are the codes that a lot of people are asking me you know what do you run what don't you run that sort of thing so if i just go right back to the beginning uh, again if i want to go into the engineer mode um I, 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 to be honest i'm not sure whether you're supposed to know these codes or not but um somebody gave it to me so you know i'm not telling you to use this but it's there if you want to use it um, and the, the engineer code i believe is 66 so we put that in and enter and then straight away you've got uh, you've got lots more codes to play with basically there's loads and loads and loads they're all in alphabetical order as you can see and the first one that i was advised to change just keep going and going and going and going and going until you get to the uh, the r's uh, and it was r2 so r2 is the uh, is the heating setting which obviously you can do from the main pump as well so sorry that was a bit of a, a red herring it's not r2 um, it's r4 so r4 is the temperature difference between what you set uh, and what the temperature actually is before the, the heat pump kicks on and off um, i think it's one degree as, as as a default and i've been advised to set it anything from 0.5 to 0.3 there we go and all that means is i've got it set on 0.5 so with a temperature of 17 degrees, if, if it goes down to 16.5, that's when the heater comes on, it'll go up to 17.5 and then the heater clicks off um, and that's it. And then R, where are we then? Uh, I think R12 is the next one and that's the power on difference and the same sort of thing really, it's set at, uh, set at half a degree. And the other one that's, uh, that's interested, I think when it comes out of the factory, the minimum heat, which is R10, I think it's set at 15 degrees or 16 degrees, something like that. Uh, and obviously for a winter type setting, uh, you want, you know, if you want to give your, your coil proper, proper um, wintering, then obviously you want it to go colder than that. So you could just use, you know, you just click on it here and go up and down, put your put your put your number in, and then cl click enter, um, and you can put in what you want. Well, say put in what you want. I think 10 degrees is the minimum. So it's at 10 degrees at the moment, and that's that's it really. I mean, that answers most of the questions that uh, I say people have asked me. Um, it's a great unit. 
Uh, as I say, I like the colour controls. You can have a silent fan off if you ha if you happen to be sighted next to somebody's house or something like that. Um, you know, great bit of kit. Really, really, uh, lots of. Uh, you know, you can really make it your own. That's what I'm trying to say. Get my words out. So that that's the kit. Let me just uh, put that back on. Shut the door. Whoa. And I'll just quickly show you the, the pipe work at the back because people again have been asking me about the bypass and things like that. And it's uh, oops, it's ever so simple. I don't know how much you actually see on here. Um, trying to not send you all there, uh, goggle eyed. But basically, the uh, the water comes up through this top one here, through the heat pump. It goes out through the the bottom one, and it just returns. As you can probably see, I've got a load of crap down here. But it just goes into the side of the pond there as a mid-water return. This is all the winter uh, lagging, obviously. But the bypass valves, basically, you won't see it very well. But there's a there's a bore valve there. There's a bore valve there, and there's a bore valve there. So if I want to bypass the heater, I turn that one off, turn that one off, turn that one on, and then the water just comes straight round there without, uh, without going through the heater. But that's it, you know, great bit of kit. This is a Thermatec 12 kilowatt, um, massively over-engineered for my pond. I think for, for, I was advised that uh, the nine kilowatt would quite easily do uh, my two and a half thousand gallon pond. Um, but obviously the bigger you go, the less effort it is, I suppose, to, to heat up and cool down. Um, so I had the opportunity to get one of these and this is the one I've gone for, but I've been pleased with it. You know, there's loads more on the market, Remora, Dream, I can't think of some of the others. Um, you know, but there's good reports about everything. You've just got to um, choose the best one that uh, you think for your pond. So I hope that was helpful. Um, we'll move on to the next question. I'll be back with you in a sec. Thanks for that. Fish are hungry as always, as you can see. I had a question recently about the pond covers. Um, you can see how I've made them in previous episodes. I was trying to just go with bubble wrap on a frame to start with, um, but a good friend of mine, Aid from Warsaw, uh, who's got a YouTube channel called Aid's Koi Pond, uh, got me some polycarbonate sheets. So these are now sort of bubble wrap on the uh, on the top, as you can see on this one. Uh, but the underside is uh, got polycarbonate on the other underside, so they're really, really well insulated. Um, but somebody was asking me basically whether we uh, take the covers off and leave them off during the day and the short answer at the minute is no if it's uh, if it's a cold day I try and give them daylight every day so I'll take one of the covers off it's in five pieces so there's one there there's two pieces missing and then there's another two on there they're actually stacked on top of one another if it's a cold day I just take one piece off to give them some daylight but if it's a sort of warmish day like today then I'll take uh, I'll take two covers off and they can uh, you know, they make most of whatever little bit of sunshine there is without wasting too much um, energy on uh, on heating the pond with the covers off. Lance lot there coming to say hello. It's beautiful. So I don't know whether you can actually see how big these fish are, but you know, he's uh, he's got the more hand feeding, which is superb. Um, something that might be interesting to a number of people is a uh, big shout out to uh, Gaz of Gaz's Koi Pond and to um, Gary and Kaz from um, Pond and Garden went on both of their uh, live talkings re recently and it was really entertaining really good fun so thank you for that but one of the questions I posed on Gazzy's on um, Thursday night where I asked the question about whether you leave you know whether um, a spin drifter like air bubbles in the pond is actually necessary because obviously when I'm out here, you know, when I've got all the covers off, it doesn't really spoil the enjoyment. Um, but when I've just got one of the covers off or two of the covers off, as you can see, you know, it does sort of take away, you can't see the fish that well. Um, and a shout out to Jack, the balding reefer um, from Reefer Aquatics. If you want to go and find those on uh, on the internet, really great shop, great products, great prices. But anyway, I had a really interesting conversation about Jack, about oxygen crashes. And the fact that they tend to happen at sort of um, two, three, four, five o'clock in the morning. Um, so, you know, to a long story short, I am leaving my uh, my bubbler on, so it never uh, it's never off at the minute, um, just in case. So I have been monitoring oxygen and text, text, testing for oxygen levels, uh, and I've not really had any problems with them. But um, you know, there's always a first time. So a really interesting conversation. Um, 
and there you go that's that's my covers um, I hope to take them off in the very near future as do lots and lots of you out there and yes I do leave my bubbler on all the while after uh, after asking that question and having that conversation about um, oxygen depletion in the water and the fish is still very hungry so I'll catch you in a bit and I'll come back with the next uh, next answer to some queries so the next question I get asked a lot about is um, trickle in trickle out and how I run mine what I do with mine how fast I run it um, and the thing is the same as most of, these, most of these questions I'm giving you my opinion on today um, just need to be clear it is my opinion I'm no fish expert I've learned what I've learned through the hobby everybody's ponds different everybody's fish are different everybody's approach to fish keeping is different so you know when, when you're listening to my videos and other videos on YouTube just just sort of bear in mind that that's that's how, what we found best what I found best for my pond and fish so trickle in trickle out mine dead dead simple so I'll spin you around so I've got a, a hose pipe that actually runs from all around the outside of the house you can imagine the hose pipe running all the way around the outside of the fence there and then it comes in through a hole in the wall there and it just literally well, you, can see, you can probably see it's a blue hose pipe at the back there it just goes down onto the floor and it goes into the back of a standard via three age three age three step dechlorinator which you can see here it comes out of there and then it goes straight into the pre-filter of my big blue uh, which I've got standing at the side of the um, the side of the uh, individual unit and then it comes out of here and the pipe just comes straight at the side and through the top of the, the hatch which has got holes drilled in uh, and into the into the pump, pump chamber there um, obviously I say it's a big blue, it's not the big blue that a lot of people have got which is the big, I think the 3 foot 36 inch one, mine's the 2 foot um, 24 inch one and that's simply because I want to put it down the side here and it just fits under my, uh, my pipework nicely but anyway there you go so that, that is the speed of my trickle in at the moment after it's been through all the uh, dechlorinators and the, and the big blue and I've just timed it um, and it's running at um, about, there you go, so in a minute, I don't know why you can see that, it's about uh, 150 millilitres per minute, so that works out to my pond size of about 13% water change per week for the entire pond. Um, again, recommendations, is it 10%, is it 20%, do you do more when you're doing some things than others? Uh, it's just my opinion, that, that's what I do at the minute. But the reason I prefer a trickle, in to a, a trickle out to a, to a big clean or a big purge is quite simply because it's constantly happening. So it's constantly going into the, uh, the water at a very, very, very steady rate. Uh, and obviously because I've got a drum filter, I do need to constantly keep topping up um, so I could do a ball valve and like a you know a system on the toilet type thing, um, but I've just, just chose to do it this way. And my trickle out or overflow, which is probably the easier way to think about it, is just in the standpipe I've created for rodding. I've got a push fit. It's not welded. It's not uh, hard fitted, so I can I can twist it round. I've just set a 90 degree angle, uh, 90 degree bend. Sorry, to just touch the lip of the water you can probably just see the water just sort of bouncing on the bottom lip and obviously if it gets any higher than that it just runs through there and there's a uh, one of these seal things they're really good so I've got a pipe coming out the end of that straight down onto the floor floor straight along the floor and then there you go discharges into the into the waste chamber where my um, discharge for the units go if I want to flush the units and where the um, discharge for the drum the cylinder goes I keep that on there quite simply because when I'm doing jobs in here I keep dropping screws on the floor and you barely they end, uh, end up down there so yeah I mean again you've got to do what suits your pond best um, whether you're on 10% 12% 13% 15% 20% of your pond per week um, I'm running 13 at the minute probably will up it slightly for the summer um, but at the moment as you can see from my uh, Big blue over there, um, pH is 8.1, temperature is 17 degrees, uh, and my TDS, total dissolved solids, is running at three, 310 at the moment, which I know is rubbish, but 
you know, unless I do uh, extreme things, I'm never going to get that down because it comes out very high from the tap. The thing that I always just look at, to be honest, is, you know, just looking at the water clarity uh, in the individual unit here. This is what's getting pumped back into the pond. And yes, I can see one or two little uh, fines and things like that, but am I, am I bothered? Am I bothered? Uh, no, I'm not. You know, as long as, long as the water's um, clearish, so I can see the fish, I'd rather the fish be happy and the water be right for them than uh, being crystal clear for me to keep looking at. So uh, again, that's, that, that's my sort of uh, explanation, my triple in, triple out. Um, so I'll move on to the next uh, sort of comments I keep getting, which is about the actual drum filter. So I'm just going to pop the top off and then I'll come back to you. So the, the question I get asked most about my um, drum filters is just how much air I'm running through the moving bed um, and whether I think you know you should be going faster or slower or whatever. And again, it's just whatever works best for your pond. Um, the manufacturer, when, when I bought this uh, filter, I think it comes with six, 60 litres of Helix 13 anyway. So Helix 13 is obviously the VORZ um, 13mm plastic media. Um, and you can, uh, and it recommends that you run that on a certain speed of air pump, and then it says you can go up another 20 litres of helix, which obviously I've done. Uh, and to do that, you need to increase your flow on the uh, speed put on the air pump. Sorry, um, but the concern for me was when I went out and actually bought the air pump that was recommended. This was like it was foamy. It was it was like a jacuzzi on full blast. Uh, and the thing that concerned me was how does the how does the good bacteria stay on the um, on the media when it's absolutely turning over like a torrent? So this this might be interesting for um, Simon at up north Coy because he sort of been having a conversation with him about um, you know the speed this should be going over at. And I've I've always been told that uh, it shouldn't it shouldn't look like the cleaning cycle. On, uh, on a nexus, you know, when you're boiling the media, it shouldn't look like that. It should just be like a nice turnover, making sure everything's turning over, all the corners are moving, that sort of thing. Um, so this, you know, this is how I'm running mine. It was running a lot, lot, lot faster, um, but it seemed to take ages and ages and ages for the white media to start getting that nice brown colour that we're all looking for. And as soon as I turned it down a bit, um, this is what I'm getting. So this, at the moment, it's only running with um, it's uh, that Jabo 35, 35 litres per hour per minute per hour litres per minute. Of course, it's litres per minute, Phil. So 35 litres per minute. Um, that's all that's running on here at the minute. And I think it was recognised, uh, sorry, recommended to be something like 60 litres. And then if you put the 80 litres of the Helix in, go up to 80 litres. There's no way. I, I could have. I was running with this and the bottom drain at one point, um, but sort of similar to my pumps, I thought, well, if one fails, I don't want, you know, I don't, don't want to finish to stop doing everything. So I, um, I put two pumps on. So the J about 35 litres per minute is running this, and I think this is more than needed. So I keep, I keep watching the corners to make sure there's nothing stuck in the corners, um, even, even where the pipes are there for the air coming in. And then you can see that. You know, if you watch longer, if you think something's getting to the corner, all of a sudden it will all change over. So there's a constant flow there, you know, there's a constant flow at the other corners. It's, it's definitely turning everything over all the while. But it's obviously slow enough that it's uh, allowing the bacteria to sort of um, populate the media. So, as I say to me, it's up to you how you run it, how it works best for you and your pond. I'm running it slower than it actually recommends in the book because I'm finding that it's um, it's, it's building up your bacteria. My water readings are a lot a lot better since I started running it a little bit, a little bit slower. So just something to consider, something to try. So hopefully that answers uh, questions for a, for a few people. Um, yeah, I'll snap back to you in a bit.